with my tears, arms open wide, you ran to me with your mercy, your mercy, your mercy, I stand before my to repentance. Amen. Folks, I got to say, I think those two songs were for me today. I'm sorry. You can enjoy them too. But I've been so amped up this morning running around. They were so worshipful and they calmed my spirit. I was sitting here and saying, I needed that. It was so good. And it's good to see all you here today. You know, I have to be on my best behavior today because one of my workmates is here, Della. The delegator. I have to behave. Or else when I go to work tomorrow, I'll get a severe, severe, I don't know what. But uh, I'm so glad that she and her family here visiting with us today. She's taking a break from her church just to keep an eye on me. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> but uh, but uh, let's do this. Let's, uh, let's have a word of prayer and then just greet each other. Let them know you're glad to see them. Let, let each other know you're glad to be here. Where else are you going to be? You know? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning, Lord. Father, you are good to us all the time, and we're so thankful for that, Lord. We thank you for your loving kindness, Lord. It led us to repentance, Father. Father, you are our Savior. You are our Lord. 
We thank you for everything we get to do today, Lord, because there's so much in our service today, and it's so exciting. Help us glorify you in all that we do. In your son's holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Greet each other. Say hi. Would you people please stop loving each other? <laughs> Enough of the hugging. Enough hugging. Man. Amen, Carrie. Amen. I'm going to have to get security in here to break you people up. Amen. Hey, folks, when you, when you get done hugging, please have a seat. Please have a seat when you're done hugging. This is good. This is good. We're getting our exercise in. Please have... You, you. So, folks, this morning, this morning, this is great. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're really glad to see each other. And this morning, uh, we will, we're going to have a testimony this morning before I start preaching and teaching and, and running your ears, Okay. Brother Henry has a testimony he'd like to share. You can do it here or there, wherever you like. Come on up, brother. Give right. your testimony. Right. Listen, and remember, you know the rules. You know, someone's up to you. You've got to smile. They've got to feel welcome and loved. Wow, look at this. All of love. I feel it, Pete. <laughs> so, you know, um, one of the things that when I first got saved, somebody had put in my heart was that it is not in your ability, but your availability, right? And so always looking for ways to be available to share the gospel, touch somebody's life. And so um, I had a coworker who uh, was with us for about nine months, and she uh, was getting married and moving out of state. And so good riddance, have a nice day, you know, <laughs> have a nice life. Bye, nice to meet you, nice to see you. And, you know, out of mind, out of sight, out of mind. So she gets married in January, and all of a sudden she's back at work in the beginning of February. And I'm like, what are you doing here? And she said, well, I'm here to cover someone. And God touched my heart at that moment and said, mm, cry a little bit, right? Are you okay? And you know the normal response is what? Well, yeah, I'm good. And usually we walk away, and it was like, mm, no, you're not you want to talk, I'm here. So Wednesday night, she was late person. And what that means basically is she was the last person to leave outside of me because I'm the last person to leave. And she opened up about 
how she made a mistake, that this wasn't the person she was supposed to marry, and that she already had plans to meet up with somebody else tomorrow night, which would have been Thursday night. Exposed her husband for all the things he did wrong. And um, through conversation with her, realized that she was carrying some serious baggage. And it wasn't him at all. You know, whenever you're pointing one finger at somebody, usually there's three pointing back, right? Amen. And so through a little bit of conversation Wednesday night, she broke down and um, just had a meltdown uh, because of the depravity of where she was. So I said, instead of going to meet up with that dude tomorrow night, why don't you come over to my wife's my house and God love my wife at a moment's notice. Oh yeah, no problem. I'll make chicken piccata, Alfredo sauce, angel here pasta, you know. Anybody that's come to couples ministry, I think you guys experienced that once. And it's one of my favorite meals. So I'm just like, yeah, <laughs> this is a twofer, right? I get to share the gospel and I'm getting fed good food. Sweet. So the next night she showed up to our house and I had given her a homework assignment. And I want you to write down everything that's bothering you. Well, boy, did she come with a list. <sighs> right? Broke my heart to hear what this woman had gone through. From younger than Jocelyn, she could remember being sat on her couch while her alcoholic father beat her mother, senseless, and then proceeded to beat the garbage out of each one of those kids. From there, being uh, sexually abused at 12, even more abused between 13 and 15, putting a gun to her head at 17, These are tears of absolute compassion for this girl. I can't imagine the horror that she had seen. And so she shared with us Thursday night. God bless my wife because she's got a great testimony. And she's been through her own horrors. And because of her being willing to open up and share about the horrors that she had, really allowed this girl to open up, and she had never told a soul, not her husband, not any of her best friends, nobody close to her, the horrors that she had experienced. We were the first. She's 25 years old. To carry that around was horrific. So what do I have to share? I mean, I mean really, we're, we're, this is somebody's life here. Her life is ending. She's going to end this marriage. She, she just wants to die. She has no hope. But again, it's about just being available. And God gives you the ability and the words and what she needs because it's about his goodness and his kindness, right? So Wednesday night, or Thursday night, um, we gave her some tools. She wasn't ready to hear the gospel. And I told her if she wanted to come back, uh, she could come back Saturday morning because she was decided at that point she was going to go home and work on her marriage, and she was going back home Sunday. Praise the Lord right there, right? Amen. So, you know, one down. Okay, marriage, we're back on the right track. Friday, I go to work, and she ignores me like the plague all day. And I'm like, oh, the enemy got in. I had shared with her one of the most important things that she needs to do. Because when I asked her Thursday night what it was um, that bothered her most, it was that she was fat and ugly. Because that's what was told to her from as far back as she can remember. And to this day, she's still getting that. So just to fight that a little bit, I said, God doesn't make mistakes. 
And every time you look in the mirror, I want you to write it down, post it on your mirror, God doesn't make mistakes. You are proportionately beautiful, period. God had knit you in the womb, went through that. Um, and then she came out and she said, well, I'm angry with God. I said, wow, okay. How, if there's a loving God out there, how could he allow all this stuff to happen to me? I said, wow. Can I ask you when the last time you thanked him for any of the good things in your life? Like breathing, enjoying a meal, warmth of a bed, and all those, those things sound trivial. We've got to start somewhere. I said, but your anger is directed in the wrong place. You have an enemy that hates you. And you're the object of God's love. And unfortunately, he's going to attack you because he can't attack God. I said, I want you to marinate on that. And Saturday, if you so choose to come, we'll talk more about it. So Friday, she avoided me like the plague. 4.30, she said her goodbyes to everybody. She decided she was going back home, leaving the state. And right before she walked out, my door was one of these big, heavy sliders, you know, at work. And I hide in my office and watch movies and don't really work. And you know, what a great <laughs> testimony. No, I'm kidding. Um, but she, she slides the door open. She peeks her head in. And she goes, I'll see you tomorrow morning. OK. Slam. And I'm like, oh, I guess she's coming tomorrow morning. So I call my wife. And I say, hey, guess what? She's coming tomorrow morning. You know, she's, you know, I'll make ourselves available, right? She shows up Saturday morning. And now it's, I'm thinking, how can I, how can I, now, now I'm putting it on me. How can I save this girl, right? How can I do this? How can I, 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 finally God was like, will you shut up already? <laughs> <laughs> you know. Played two songs for her. The importance of music, thank you, really, ladies, Joanna, wherever you are. I mean, really. Opens the heart to receive the word. So if any of you have seen I Can Only Imagine, the movie, I played the song for her, had her watch the trailer, and then I had her listen to uh, Death Was Arrested. In the beginning of that song, alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin, right? The tears started flowing. Wow, she's ripe to hear the gospel. I opened the Gospel of John, chapter 3. I explained everything to her that God did not come into the world to condemn the world, but that through him, right, everyone could be saved. I said, is this something she wanted? She said, yes. I said, no, you don't. Wait a minute. Why would you say that? Because when we share the Gospel... We try, we try so hard to get them to that point of making a decision that we don't warn them about the pitfalls that are coming. Because the moment you decide you're going to become a Christian, you're taking on three enemies. The devil, the world, and yourself. And she needed to know that the decision she made, and she's going to make, there's going to be a cost. And it's coming from somebody who's had such a horrific past to think that she's going to lose something else. She needed to understand what she's gaining, too. So with that, my wife and I, we got down right there on our living room floor, and we prayed, and she accepted the Lord, and we gave her a Bible and a Bible devotional, and then it was, okay, we got to get you plugged in. So I went to Google. Thank you, Google. Found a church that was close to her, contacted them right away, said, expect blah, 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 and I did it on her phone so that she would get the email and the responses from them because, you know, so often we, you know, we get to plant seeds. It's not a often that we get to actually reap the harvest right then and there. But then once we've reaped the harvest, we usually go, wow, that was cool, and off to the next, right? And instead I wanted to make sure that she was equipped to not have to walk alone. And so if I can just encourage you guys, whether you're in your workplace, in the grocery store, wherever you're at, if there is an opportunity for you to, just with a smile, a touch of the shoulder, whatever, 
you know, to show compassion and caring and kindness. This wasn't a relationship that was built over that nine months. It was, hi, how you doing? I'm in my hole. You know what I mean? She was a short-term employee. Um, but God decided to intervene at that moment and use my wife and myself uh, to him be the glory and the honor. Um, but all of heaven rejoiced, it says in Luke 15, right? That was my post yesterday. Uh, for all those of you on Facebook, just a rejoicing knowing that, you know, God snatched another one from the pit of hell and now has given her newness of life so that now she too can experience the forgiveness and the healing that God had desired for her all along. Anyway, so thank you for allowing me to share that piece. Awesome. first message today, huh? <laughs> How cool is that, huh? It, it, it's, we heard it, uh, a lot of it Friday night, and we were, waiting for, we were waiting for the sequel from Saturday, and we got it. It was great. <sighs> okay, let's focus. I'm going to shift gears from the testimony to the Word, though the Word was in the testimony. So <clears throat> message that we have today is the intensity of fasting. So we're going to change up our diet a little bit today because we've been in Ephesians for quite some time, right? I thought we need to change our diet a little bit. We need to, we need to eat something different from words, the Word of God. We're going to be in Isaiah 58. Now this concept of fasting that we're involved with, I mean, you go back 10 years ago in our society, fasting really wasn't the craze that it is now. But now we think about it, fasting, it's in social media, there's self-help gurus out there and a lot of societal pressures regarding fasting or giving up food or some kind of food for your health. It's huge. Fasting is giving up something. The primary type of what's mainly given up when we talk about fasting is food. And the most common fast is from food for like, you know, you fast for a day. But there's all kinds of fasts out there. You've heard of them, right? There's the intermittent fast where you don't eat for 16 hours, then you eat for eight hours and has some great health benefits. You lose weight, stuff passes into your body, metabolism changes, it's all cool. There's, the, uh, there's one I heard of, it's called a 5-2 a, a fast, where you eat for five days, and in between there, you fast for two days. And it's got some health benefits. This is good. When we get up every morning, we have breakfast, right? Breakfast. It's, it's, it's amazing. The word says break fast. It's breakfast. We're used to it. We have a fast. There's something called a multi-day fast. And the multi-day fast is a little crazy to me. You eat one day, fast the next day, eat one day, fast the next day for like a couple of weeks. That sounds really tough. I don't know about that one. And with regards to fasting, a lot of people have some physical constraints, don't they? I mean, people might have diabetes or a health condition does not allow them to fast, and that's fine. And some people, they can't do that. Some people just reduce their meals as a fast, or some people just skip a meal as a fast. I remember one time, Marta and I, we were down in Costa Rica. We were down there building with, at the Children's Lighthouse Home, and it was a group there from North Carolina. And we were down there, and I'm in the kitchen basically cook. I like to cook when I go places, you know. I cook a little at home, but when I go away, I cook a lot. And Larry and F's there tell him, Pete, do this. Pete, do that. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I just have a great time. I'm doing all these things. And there was a woman helped me in the kitchen. So you know that southern expression when someone gets under the, someone's skin? You know how down south they say, well, bless her heart. <laughs> well, bless her heart. She was just telling me about, I should eat this. I shouldn't eat that. Eat at this time, at that time. She had great intentions. I'm on a missions trip. Come on, lady, give me a break. You know, it was funny, but it was a really a good time, and, and it worked out well, and all went through there. But. And nowadays, the most popular fast is the keto fast. It's like all over the map, the keto fast. It's a, it's a diet that you go through a fast where you fast from carbohydrates. You don't eat cake and donuts. You don't eat carbohydrates. You eat a lot of meat and fats and, 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 and veggies. And it turns out for some people, particularly people with diabetes, I guess it's good for it. It has some good health effects. It helps you lose weight. That's fine. That's all good. Your body goes into something called ketosis. Yeah, well, we're not going to do chemistry now. Trust me, we're not. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, why do we have all these fasts here in America? It's because we have so much. Our fasts are voluntary. We go to some other countries. Their fasting is not, not, not so much because they don't have as much to eat. So I guess it's still a fast because food's denied from you. But fasting really is good, and I applaud it. I, I, I applaud people trying to make their health better. I really do. 
Uh, I've been sick for like forever, I think. Yesterday's the first day I worked out down in my basement. That's good. I really applaud people improving their health and fasting and having a good diet. And I would suggest you all with the nice weather the next couple of days, you actually go for a walk every day too. One of the best things in the world. That's all good. But all the fasting that I've just mentioned are fasts focusing on ourselves. Everything was about me, I just said. That's okay. Take care of your health. But we want to step back from that a little bit. That's what we're going to do now. But first, we're going to pray before we get into our text. Lord, I do thank you for this morning, Lord. Uh, it's so good. I see my brothers and sisters sitting here, Lord. Father, we've got a great testimony to kick off this time of worship, Lord. Uh, you are so good, Lord. Please guide my words as I speak, Father. And whoever needs to hear these words, I hope they're sitting in this pew or they, or they hear it, see the v YouTube video, whatever it is, Lord, that someone's life will be changed because of your word, because of what you do in people's lives, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. So Isaiah 58 brings fasting to a whole different light. See, and also understand fasting is all over the word of God. It's amazing the number of times fasting comes up in the word of God. And I'm not going to go the whole list of fasts in the Word of God, so don't worry about that. But I want to suggest to you, as we go through Isaiah 58, if you have your Bible, I would open up to it. Or if you don't have your Bible, the Pew Bible in front of you, it's on page 419, I think. Why am I saying that? It's because, it, it, and Mark will still have all the verses up here. You know, he's, he's a machine back there. But my point being that these verses are chunky. There's a lot to them, right? They're like chunky peanut butter that if you're fasting, you're not going to eat. And, uh, and there's a lot to them. Uh, there, so if you want to just open up to that. But, but why so much fasting in the Bible? Why would God instruct his children to fast? Remember what Jesus did when uh, he fed the 5,000 with two loaves of bread and some fishes, right? Great miracle. You know what we forget sometime? God feeds the whole world every single day. If you think about that, every single day. I doubt anyone in this room has gone hungry. If, and if you have today, it's because you didn't get the cake that's out back. It, it's there. But we're going to go through Isaiah 58 some bites at a time. Because the way the text is set up, you can just go through, you work your way through this text. So starting in verse 1 of Isaiah 58, it says, Cry aloud, spare not. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Tell my people their transgressions and the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily. They delight to know my ways. As a nation that did righteousness, it did not forsake the ordinances of their God. They ask, they ask of me the ordinances of justice. They take delight in approaching God. This sounds and starts off, it's just great. It sounds like Israel is really, you know, they're, they're on mission. They're doing their job. They're really there. They want to know God's ways. And we always need to remember, and if you want to know God's ways, that means you want to be near God. You want to be close to God. You want to emulate his ways. Remember what we've learned in the book of Acts. The first Christians were called people of the way before they were called Christians because they were walking the way that God wanted them to go. These people were here too. It says that these people were approaching God, coming boldly. You're coming boldly to the mercy seat. That's what they were doing. Think about, think about children. You ever notice children sometimes with their mom and dad? You know, and, 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 if, and if Jocelyn was still up here, I could get her to do it for me. She'll just climb up on a mom and dad. That's what children do, don't they? They just climb right up on you. And, and if you're talking, what will they do? If Candace is talking, she'll, Jocelyn will go like this. But mommy. <laughs> They'll take, children don't care about personal space. They love you. They're up in your face. You're mommy and dad. They're up close. They're up pro, they're, it's up close and personal. It's really great. In Hebrews 4.16, it says to us, let us there come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace in a time of need. Come boldly. Draw near. It's a delight. When we delight in God, we're drawing near to God. Whenever you see the word delight, think of drawing near, because you want to be near those things. But then we get to verses 3 and 4, and some things start to get revealed. Why have we fasted, they say? And you have not seen. Why have we afflicted our souls and you take no notice? In fact, in the day of our fast, you find pleasure and exploit all your laborers. Indeed, you fast for strife and debate and to strike with fists of wickedness. You will not fast as you do this day and make your voice heard on high. 
This is not how to fast. <laughs> uh, there's a disconnect here. There's a disconnect here in Israel's outward appearance, the veneer, right? The veneer is the outward appearance. The difference between that and what's going on inside in their hearts. It's sort of like this pulpit, this oak on top, it's not a veneer, it's solid. You drill through in the middle, it's oak. It's all the way here. But Israel here has a problem. They're not solid. They have a heart problem. There's a definite heart problem here. And heart problems sometimes can be hard to detect. If you want to find out about our hearts and stuff, you can go to doctors. They got these things called a, a CT cardiac scan. You can go get it now. It'll look inside your body. Start looking at the arteries and stuff in your heart, and they'll see who's clogged and who isn't clogged. This is phenomenal, right? The heart's revealed. Also, if you cannot take care of yourself, you can have a heart attack. Your heart's revealed then, isn't it, too? You didn't take care of yourself. That's the physical heart that I'm talking about here. That's what it is. But you look at me here, right? I'm up here. I'm Pete. I'm the preacher. I'm looking pretty good. Got the suit. My shoes are shined. I look the part, don't I? Can you see my heart? It's a funny thing, isn't it? We can't see each other's hearts. God can see my heart. And oddly enough, my wife can see my heart too. She knows me inside out. You can't see my heart. You, you don't really. I just might have just, I might have, I might have poached this right off the internet. You don't know. I didn't. <laughs> I loved studying this. I had the best time. Oh, it was so cool. Studying God's word is, it's great. But given time, the heart is always revealed. Hey, have you ever searched for a radio station? This happens to me. Sometimes I drive down south. You know, we drive down to see my, the, the, my, my outlaws down there in Virginia. And, and, and uh, we're driving down to see, I know they're in-laws. That's cute. And uh, we're driving down there. And as you drive down, by the time I get to southern Rhode Island, what's that radio station start to do? <laughs> All the static comes in, doesn't it? Because I'm getting away from the source of the station. I don't have Sirius radio, OK? I don't have all that fancy stuff. I, you know, it, it's there. But the signal's lost. We're talking about fasting now. Fasting tunes us to God's signal through prayer. That's what we're going to do. We want to tune it to God. But there was a problem with the fast that we were here. Because in this fast, these people were not being compensated for the efforts of their fast. <laughs> Think about that. I'm not being compensated. Why are we fasting? We're afflicting our souls. Don't you see me? Aren't I important? Fasting for favor is not something to savor. We savor things that we eat. Fasting for favor is no good. There's no food going to your mouth. There's nothing to savor. That's not what it's all about. And the motivation for fasting is so important. And we start to see this in verse 5. Is it a fast I have chosen? A day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head like a bulrush? To spread out sackcloth and ashes? Would you call this a fast? An acceptable day of the Lord? So what's the motivation for fasting? Is it a punishment? It sounds like a punishment here. Oh, sackcloth and ashes. It's horrible. Have you ever fasted? I don't know. if you know, Don't raise your hands. Have you may not have. That's OK. We don't teach fasting that much in the Christian circles. We're going to, because I think it's really important. We don't. But if you have ever fasted, I want to ask you, what was your motivation for fasting? Was it something for yourself, or was it directed towards someone else? Because this, this text we're looking at, it really is it's putting things out there for us. Because as we go through a fast, what are the dynamics? What's the mindset? Why? Because fasting is hard. If you've ever fasted, fasting is hard. There's a big difference between being a little bit hungry and the hunger pang that hits at about 15 hours into a 24-hour fast. Trust me. 15 hours, you start to feel it. But those 15-hour hunger pains is when something good can really happen. But it goes back to the statement in our text. Is it a fast that I have chosen? The I in the text is God. Is it a, is it a fast that God has chosen? I remember years ago, Marta and I, we were working with the teens, and we did this 24-hour fast with them. One thing I've learned about teens, OK, you learn, when you're working with teens, you do whatever they want, unless it is illegal, or might just maybe get you killed. You do whatever the teens want to do. 
if they're hot, because you just do it. You just go for it, just go, just do it. So they decided they wanted to, it must have been through school or something. I can't remember everything, but we did it. So like on a Friday at around 8.30 in the morning, we started a fast. They went to school, they fasted. I went to work, I fasted. And then about ah, 5 o'clock, we all came here, and we stayed together. We, we, all, all evening, we, we talked about the Word of God. I didn't preach at them, but we went through some things. We talked about fasting, and they were hungry. And probably around 9 o'clock, maybe 10, everyone's really tired, <laughs> right? You're fasting. So all over the church building, we're sleeping. Oh, we're sleeping in the pews, downstairs. We're sleeping everywhere. And this is different because we've done a lot of activities with the teens, overnighters with them, where we have a lot of food, and we do games all night long, and no one's allowed to go to sleep. But one time we had a, a young lady, she just, she, just, she, was sit, she just fell asleep in this position someplace. It was a, I have a picture. She just conked out. What are you going to do? But we did this fast, and they learned so much. They learned a lot about themselves. They learned about the pain of fasting, you know, if you want to call it pain. Because they're pains that hit, just be honest. And it was a great experience. The next morning we got up, and everyone was a little bit, you know, I'll tell you, I was too. And, uh, and we went out to like one of those all-you-can-eat places, and we had a whole bunch to eat. The problem was after you fast that much, you can't eat much. And the food's not really good at those places. The bottom line is we had a great time, but they wanted to learn about fasting, and, and we did, and it was a great experience. At 15 hours, something important happens, though. The hunger alarm sounds, I'm hungry. I'm real hungry. You're real hungry at this time. Why? That's right. I'm fasting. Duh. Because you just get a little bit messed up. I'm so hungry. I'm fasting. And at this time, I think one of two things happens. You start to look at your watch or your phone. What time is it at 15 hours? Oh, nine more hours to go. 16 hours. Oh, eight more hours to go. You're in misery. You're uncomfortable. And this easily can happen the first time you fast. Trust me. It's been there. Or the denial of food, the discomfort of the moment turns one's mind to the object of the fast that God has chosen for you. That pain drives you to the object of the fast that you started out with. The motivation for fasting is revealed. Our hearts at times are revealed to us. This is important to have our hearts revealed to us. Think about that. Our hearts, our hearts can be deceived deceived as they're attached to our self-serving brains. Ever think about that? On my brain, you know, I can, I can, I can, Henry was talking about, you know, just be available to do something. You can rationalize not doing a lot of things, can't you? That means you've, you've crushed whatever your heart told you to do. We don't want to do that. We want to let our heart move us towards what we're going to be doing. We do. Fasting is not self-imposed misery. What should we look like when we fast? Well, there's a great thing about that. Jesus told us. Literally what we should look like when we fast in Matthew 6, 16. Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, I know, I'm putting it in there, that they may appear to men to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their rewards already. It says, but you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face. The point being when we're fasting, it's not about us. We don't need to look all sad and bad about this. That's not what it's about. God's strengthening us in doing something. And one more note about fasting. If you're fasting and it just becomes too hard, don't start complaining. Stop your fast. It's okay. Go eat an apple. Eat an apple. I love apples. Go eat an apple. And when you're eating the apple, think about the object of the fast while you started to in the first place. That's all that matters. Fasting isn't a pride thing. It isn't any of these things. It's not about us. Don't worry about it. You know? It, it, it's not like, it wasn't like a good try. No, you're doing something for God that God has burdened on your heart. Prayer is brought to the highest level of consciousness in our life. Our hunger during a prayer, I love this, our hunger has, is, has been, been become an intensifier of prayer. Your hunger is, is, is an intensifier of prayer. Something has burdened your heart. You've committed to fasting regarding it. Fast should not be taken lightly. The burden of your heart is of God's choosing. Prayer. Prayer is so important. We should not casually ask other people to pray for something that we do not. This is, this is a big one with me. You got a pedism here. Sorry, you're going to get it. Example. Say you know that someone's, someone's sick. Someone may have cancer. They may be going to a car accident. 
or you know that this couple's, their marriage is breaking up, or the, the children are a mess, or the house is a mess. I, I get it. A situation's there. Okay? Uh, that has all happened. It's there. The scenario, whatever, is not important. But if I am going to ask you to pray about something, it should be a real burden of my heart. Disseminating information about a situation is not to be in the form of a prayer request. We must be careful that we are first committed to praying. Prayer is about communing with God. Prayer is not casual. When we, when we take a prayer request, you know, we don't do it Sunday mornings. We do it Thursday nights, but, but we should be. And here's how it should go. This is crazy, okay? I'm being legalistic. Shoot me. Okay? Here's how it should go. If we had, you should already have a burden on your heart. If I were to say, can I tell you any prayer requests? Hands just simply, simply go up. If you have something you're praying about, think about it. If something's burdening your heart, you're already thinking about it, aren't you? It's on your mind. It's on your heart. Bam, that's a prayer request. You're already, it's, it's in. It's in your heart. It's already in the arena of prayer. You're already communing with God on this. Uh, we don't want to be in a situation when we uh, take up prayer requests and uh, you start searching around for something to pray. Oh, Pete just asked for prayer requests. There must be something. There must be something I want to pray about. You know, that's just a passing thought. That's not what it's all about. I want you to think about where you are right now. This building, this is a house of prayer. That's what the building is. Us, we're the church. That makes us prayer warriors. There's a relationship here. This is just a house of prayer. It's awesome. We have this here, but it's a house of prayer, and it's great, and it's here, and we've got it. Fasting brings importance to prayer. It brings it into focus. Fasting intensifies the prayer. That doesn't mean uh, that we, can have to fa we have to fast all the time. It doesn't. It really doesn't. And, and there's no real recipe for how often we should fast. But Jesus did say in Matthew 6, he says, as often as you pray. So the implication is that you do pray. You do, you do fast, right? But think about this for a moment. Recall in the Word of God as well, the Pharisee went up to pray, and he started praying, oh, God, I pray twice a week, and I'm not like this publican over here. That's a useless fast. I pray twice, a, I, I pray all this time, and I fast. That, that doesn't sound like, that's all about him, wasn't it? So we want to, we want to be careful. Our, our, our fasts and our prayers are never condemning. They're uplifting. That's why they're happening. Because our conduct, our demeanor, our spirit should be prayerful. By this, I mean that we actually look around. We actually do see needs. You know, burdens are all around us. People are broken everywhere. But what it requires us to do is we can't be looking down on our feet. We need to be looking up. We need to look around. Burdens are everywhere. And when we see those burdens, we now are available. And guess what? You can be a tool to do something about it. It's an amazing. It's amazing. Prayerfulness in our lives gets intensified by fasting and is also the initiator of good works. Think about it. In verses 3 and 4, what are they were doing? They said, in fact, in the day of your fast, you find pleasure and exploit your laborers. laborers. Indeed, you fast, to stri fast with strife and debate to strike fists of wickedness. The fast here was to receive something. Exploiting your workers, causing strife, having fists of wickedness. Why? Because you're hungry? This is not the intensity of a godly fast or prayer. Two weeks ago, we did Ephesians 2.10. I love Ephesians 2.10. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We have been saved to do good works. In Ephesians 2.10, what does it say? That God prepared them beforehand. Isn't that just what God said in Isaiah? He said in Isaiah, Is this a fast I have chosen? God prepares these things for us. He prepares our good works. He prepares what we're going to fast and pray about. Every time the hunger of a fast growls and pains us, even at times during your fast, you might feel a little lightheaded or spacey. That happens. You're in a fast. This is what happens, folks, if you haven't done it. The chosen purpose, which is the higher purpose, will be the focus of your mind. Your desire will be drawn intensely to the person that's the object of your prayer. The fast is a tool that helps us lose weight. 
lose self-focus we have and truly esteem others better than ourselves. That excites me so much. I love it when we're esteeming others better than ourselves. Now, we're told in Hebrews to lay aside every weight and every sin that so easily ensnares us. Fasting, which God is in favor of, okay, this is something God's in favor of, not just Pete, brings to light the weights that ensnare us. It's a weight loss program. Being near to God. God being the delight will change us. The weight of sin is far away when we're close to God. Think about it. What kind of weight do we want to lose? I don't want my sin. I need to be close to God. There we are praying for someone's situation. And you know what's funny about it? We're oblivious to the fact that God already has it all in control. But that's okay. He's omniscient, folks. He is there. But the fast, the prayer, the focus towards others through God is changing us. The fast is changing us. See the fasting where it really leads up to. In verse 6 it says, Is this not a fast I have chosen? To loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, that you break every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and to bring to your house the poor who are cast out? When you see the, na when you see the naked that you cover him and hide not yourself from your own flesh? <sighs> James 2.15, we know this verse. If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of food, uh, daily of food, when, when, when one of you says to them, depart from me, be warm and filled, but you do not give him the need, the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Oh, all this is piled in here. There's so much in these verses. These verses are chunky, folks. There's a lot in there. You can go back to them. We don't have time for me to go through every one of those elements. It's all in there. But the fast in verses 6 and 7 sets free the bonds of wickedness, heavy burdens. Why? Because the fast takes the attention off ourselves and our attentions on someone else. Here's what I find. I find it hard. It said, you know, you, you won't be wicked any longer. I find it hard to be wicked when I love someone. Think about that. I find it hard to be wicked when I love someone. It's true. God's not wicked. God is love. Thus, if I'm loving someone, I'm no longer wicked. You know, it might not be sustainable, but, but it sure is pleasurable to be out of sin. You know, in my burdens, I've found are always light when I'm lifting someone else up. It's an amazing, an amazing effect. Shouldn't it weigh more, you know, lifting something else up? It never does. See, God's physics are beyond the understanding of, of our imaginations. In verse 8 it says, when, you, when your light breaks forth like the morning, your healing shall spring forth speedily, and your righteousness shall go before you, and the glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call the Lord, and the Lord will answer. You will cry, and he will say, Here am I. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of fingers and the wickedness of speaking. How is fast... How can fasting change us? I, I can't cover all these things, but I'm going to give you one sort of example. Perhaps you work in a work environment that's a little abusive, and you, go, and you relive it every single day, right? You go in there every single day. It's like a toxic work environment. You know what the definition of insanity is? According to Einstein, pretty smart guy, right, Einstein? is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. You're going to work over and over expecting different results. You're faced to having to do something. Why? Well, think of this. You have a burden because of the end of verse 9. Were you pointing fingers and speaking wickedness? Ouch. Meaning you probably were murmuring and complaining because your situation's so bad to those on your side of the situation. You ever done that? You know, we've really got it rough because of them. It's called murmuring and complaining. I researched, it turns out complaining is not one of the fruits of the Spirit. <laughs> go figure. So uh, in earnest, in earnest, you go and fast. This is a good thing. You go fast. In fact, fasting becomes your habit. Wouldn't it be amazing if fasting becomes your habit? You go and do this. 
You're in a true fast for these people in the situation with loving kindness. But nothing changes in the situation. <laughs> that leaves one option. The prayer and the fast is going to have to change you. Yeah. God answers prayers, but in ways that glorify Him. It's true. He does. You might want to reply to this, but you don't understand, Pete. You don't understand what it's like. You don't understand how bad they are. Now, that would be my response. Then the Word of God says this. <laughs> 1 Peter 2.21 for this, for this you were called, because Christ, all, also, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps, who committed no sin, nor deceit was found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return, when he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. The son committed himself to the father in that, what we would call that horrible work situation. But that's not the answer I wanted. I tell you what, that's not what I'm looking for. I want to be all lawyered up to find a way to get even, right? Ugh. Why are they doing this to me? It's just not God's way. But if we're in prayer, if we're fasting, with the fast that God has chosen, the path will become clear. I will change. God will change me. God will calm the storm. That's why it's called faith. We focus on the situation too much. Our situations, ladies and gentlemen, are all temporary. What was happening to the people in Isaiah? They wanted something from God. Send it down to me, Lord, they said. Why have we fasted was the cry they had, right? Because they, they weren't getting theirs, whatever it was. But they weren't interested in doing anything from anyone around them. They expected this vertical blessing. You see me, Lord? Here I am. I haven't eaten for 23 hours. One more hour and I got it, right? Bless me. They expect a vertical blessing, and they had zero horizontal blessing, a, a vision. They couldn't see anyone else. How can we love the Lord our God with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind, if we exploit our neighbors, treat them wickedly, cause strife, lay burdens on them, oppressing them, while fasting? We are known as his disciples, as our love, one for another. Think how fasting would intensify that love. A fast for things, a fast is not for things to flow to you, but it's an opportunity for things to flow through you. We discussed this two weeks ago. God works in us first, then we'll be ready to do the good works that he prepared for us beforehand. Ephesians 2.10, that's where we were. He'll then work through us. A fast works in us, it focuses us on others. Prayer is intensified by fasting. Good works will flow out of the entire process. God has a plan. We are changed. We are conformed to the image of Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, we can do this over and over for the rest of our lives. What else are you going to do? You can be the healthiest person wherever you work or play. You can lose, everyone wants to lose weight, right? Going to be, be ready. You can lose 100% of yourself. <laughs> Wouldn't you lose a, like to lose 100 If you can lose 100% of yourself, you're Christ-like, right? Wouldn't that be great? 100% of yourself. You might need to consult a physician before you begin to fast because we need to be healthy enough. I know a great physician. His name's Jesus. Go to him and consult Pray, maybe fast. See the disease of sin that plagues you and I. Go away by drawing near to God, because when we're near to God, there will be no sin. I hope you found this useful, because fasting is important. It's all over God's word. It's hard. But you know what? We live in a place well, we have to literally give up things to fast because we have so much. God is good all the time, ladies and gentlemen. Let's not forget that. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for this day, Lord. I thank you for my brothers and sisters here. 
Lord, this teaching on fasting is a, it can be hard, Lord. It can be a hard thing for us to undertake. But Lord, let us come together as we fast and understand and support one another that we'll be drawn closer to you. That rather being like the church of the 21st century, as we were chatting in before Sunday school about, we'd be like a church of the first century. I know we can't be exactly like that, but Father, fasting was all over your word in the first century. We thank you and you praise you, Jesus, for the way you teach us, Lord, and you fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. What an example, Lord. Thank you and praise you, Jesus, for this time and this moment. In your son's holy and precious name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, good. We are going to have a baptism today, so I think a couple of people need to exit to go get changed. What do you think, guys? You can scoot right out. We can scoot right out. We're going to have a baptism here in a moment. Let these guys escape. We're not going to have a song now because we have enough things to take care of right now as we're here. What we'll do is a few, few of our simple things. Kathleen's heading up here. But what we'll do first is we'll take up an offering first, okay? So, gentlemen, would you please come forward to take up an offering? Thank you. Last step's going to pray. There you go. Lord, we thank you for this time together, and we thank you for uh, the message that you brought to us this week. We pray that you'll um, work in us and apply it to our lives as we uh, go out and um, see those that are in need of, of your love. And let us be that light that shines. Um, show us how we can reach out to those and, and continue to, to minister to them. We thank you for all your blessings. Pray it in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Joanna. Well, we have Kathleen here. She's going to share a missions moment with us. Are we good to go, Mark? Mark takes care of everything.
Amen. And Sam and Megan, uh, not everyone's aware of this, but I didn't get the opportunity to do it, but I know Anne-Marie did. They taught here from the Bible College a class on missions. Okay, they are, I guess, I know, did you get the chance? Yeah, Carrie took it, and they said they're phenomenal, this, this couple teaching. They're just incredible, and now they're off there doing this. So a couple of things we need to take care of. I just have a... I just want to mention a couple of the announcements that we have before we continue on here. So next week is the Lord's Table. Okay, it's a great time. So cook up a storm. We're going to have dinner afterwards. You know, we'll have a meal downstairs. You know, don't hold back. We won't be fasting. We'll be eating. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Good luck. <laughs> Thank you. Excellent. Uh, we are. So cook up a storm. Go great. We'll have a good time there. And then the following uh, Sunday, we're going to have a special business meeting voting regards to the position of the pastor. So that's going to take place these next two Sundays uh, that we're here. I think that is as far as that goes. And now we're going to have a baptism. That one's up there. We, we got, is it? Okay, men's study tomorrow night. So guys, just pop up. We're right in the out back. We're going through Proverbs as a real Bible study, verse by verse, line by line. We're finding out what it says. Yes. And so she's traveling back. She's in Philly. She stops at this museum. And right, she went to walk through the door, and there's these magnets. Um, you, you can't see it, but there's, there's these magnets on the door, and it says, "Hide your pain with this spirit." <laughs> and so she texts me immediately, and she's like, "I'm at this museum in Philly, and there's a door with word magnets on it, and this is the first saying I see." So already the spirit is showing her. You know what I mean? Just encouraging her, even as she's on her way. It's like a live stream, folks. We're getting a live stream of this young lady. Seems <laughs> really? <laughs> when does this happen? Yeah. So we're going we're to have baptism now. Uh, Rob and Candace are going to come, but just a couple of words on bapti baptism. We're not getting a sermon here, folks. Baptism, Romans 6.3, it says, Or do you not know that, by, by, that many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized unto his death? Therefore, we are buried with him through baptism unto death, into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness, newness of life. And in verse 5 it says, For if we are united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall, shall be uh, in the likeness of his resurrection. We're doing baptism. The word baptism means immersion. That's what it means. It means immersion. That's what it means. And it's an illustration of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Baptism is not for salvation. Jesus saves. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For by grace we are saved through faith. It's not of ourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. If, salva if baptism got you saved, that would be a work. It gets you wet. It's a sign of obedience. It's doing just what, the, there's two things that we do in our church we do, that are called ordinances. We do the Lord's Table, which we're doing next Sunday, and we do baptism. Those are sort of like the rules, the commands, if you will. We do those, and we do them how we see best fit worshipfully in there. Uh, so public baptism we're going to do, it's a public declaration that we are identifying with Jesus Christ. And think about this, in the first century, when they were, when they were baptized, uh, it was a little bit different than now. Because when you were baptized then, you were, you, were, you were going up potentially against the status quo. So your life sort of becomes on the line. This is a real big deal. But think how important it was for them. When, when you were getting baptized, if you got baptized and, and the brothers and sisters were right around there and the people that were mad were way back there, think how that baptism encouraged those who were baptized that might have been scared. Just saying, they might have been scared. We're doing this. And I want to tell you one thing, little story as we get set to do this. I was talking to Anne Marie before this, and Anne Marie was remembering when she was 14 years old, when she was baptized here, like in, she thinks circa 1988. Was, we were in the old building. We didn't even have a mobile bap baptistry. So we had to drive down to Holbrook, uh, down to a church down there that had one. We would go down there, and it was on a Sunday after service. And what was cool about it, she thought this was great. I wanted to share this to you. The entire church got in their cars on a hot, sunny uh, Sunday afternoon 
was excited. Everyone drove to Holbrook to see her get baptized. Isn't that cool? I, I just like, you know, you forget things. That's why we need testimonies. We need memories of these things. They're so important. They're so encouraging how God works in each and every one of us. But we have a couple of candidates today for baptism today. Isn't this cool? Yeah. So we get testimonies. We get baptism. Hey, guys, did you, did you, did you come? Let me see. We got one. How you doing? A little nervous? Oh, okay. We got Candace coming through. We, we got, all right. So, everyone smile. She's got to feel great. Yeah. So you've come, you've, come, you've come to be baptized. You accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Yes. Okay. Do you want to say anything or, or, or not? You don't, you don't have to. It's hard. No, I had it written down and I can't find it. <laughs> Isn't that the way? <laughs> but so, <laughs> so baptism, baptism is important. It, it shows obedience that she has to the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, we're going to baptize her now. We're going to get you wet. So my sister, I'm gonna, you can, you're going you're gonna to hold your nose, I'll hold your arm, okay. and, and you're gonna go, she's going to go down. He says, based on your, your profession of faith in Jesus Christ, I baptize you, my sister. You can hold your nose. Buried in the Christ, like Christ's death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection. Amen. <laughs> All right. All righty. We'll get you up carefully because she's slippery. This is the sticky part. Yeah, this is the tricky part. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All righty, go get dry. We got another one. It's a tufa. It's slippery. But there's no soap, so it's not that slippery. Come on down. Yeah, it's slick. Okay, got it? Good. I like this. Family getting baptized. Isn't this cool? This is great. So, brother, you, have, you've accepted Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior? I have. You have? Awesome. Do you want to say anything? or um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to force anyone. Yeah, um, so, and I'm glad, you know, for all the blessings that he's I study his word. Yes. Um, the easier I find it is to let go because I just want his will. Yeah. And I'm just living my life according to it. Amen. Amen. Isn't that? That's what we all need to do in prayer and fasting. So, well, brother, you, so you, when you get here, you're going to hold your nose and I'll grab your arm. Mm -hmm. But based on your profession of faith, faith brother, I'm going to baptize you. Buried in the likeness of Christ. <laughs> Raised in the likeness of his resurrection. <laughs> Amen. That was a good one. We got a splasher, guys. Awesome. Amen. All right, man. We'll get you out of here. Yeah, yeah. Be careful, yeah. Hold on. It's slick. Yeah. Amen. Well, that was great, wasn't it? Anything else? We, we, we do cover everything. I always ask Mark, did I cover everything, Mark? We did. Do we have a song to close in? Yes, sir. All right, folks, please stand as we're going to sing up a storm here. Oh, it's low voltage. Don't worry. <laughs> no, it, it, it'll help her sing. It's only like five. Oh, Mariella. Here you are, lady. <laughs> Mariella, here we go. Oh, God.
joy see what love has done he has come for us he's the saving one for joy for the